In this talk, I'm going to give a brief introduction to earthquakes from both a scientific and biblical perspective. The most powerful earthquake ever recorded with modern instruments was the Valdivia earthquake, or the Great Chilean earthquake, that took place on the 22nd of May in 1960. It registered about 9.5 on the Richter magnitude scale and lasted for about 10 minutes. Tsunami waves up to 82 feet high triggered by the earthquake battered the coast of Chile and sped across the Pacific Ocean at hundreds of miles an hour, reaching Hawaii, Japan, the Philippines, China and Australasia. The death toll isn't known for certain. Estimates range between 1,000 and 6,000 people, but it was a devastating event. So what are earthquakes? What causes them? What can they tell us about the way the earth works and about the earth's past? And how do they fit into the biblical picture of earth history? Most earthquakes originate within the rigid outermost layer of the earth, the lithosphere where the rocks are strong enough to accumulate elastic strain energy until they finally break. As rocks are deformed, elastic strain energy builds up, a bit like the energy stored in a stretched elastic band. Eventually that elastic strain energy exceeds the frictional forces holding the rocks together, with the result that the rocks suddenly and catastrophically fail. When this happens, a proportion of the elastic strain energy is transferred into the surrounding rocks, moving rapidly outwards like a shock wave from the point of rupture. We call the point at which the rupture occurs the focus, and the point on the Earth's surface directly above the focus is called the epicentre. When we plot the distribution of earthquake epicentres on a world map, we find that the great majority of earthquakes occur at the active margins of the Earth's tectonic plates. At divergent margins, where the plates are moving apart, or at transform margins, where the plates are sliding past one another, the focus of the earthquakes is typically shallow, rarely exceeding 40 miles. But at convergent margins, where the plates are moving towards one another, there can be much deeper earthquakes extending to depths as great as 430 miles. At convergent margins where an oceanic plate is sliding beneath a continental plate and descending into the Earth's mantle, the focus of the earthquakes gets progressively deeper along a zone sloping at an average of about 45 degrees, called a Benioff zone. Earthquakes occur within the descending slab, because it's cold and rigid and therefore subject to brittle fracture, in contrast to the plastic style of deformation that characterises the warm mantle rocks around it. So the zone of earthquakes essentially marks out the location of the cold descending slab of ocean lithosphere. Where two continental plates collide, we typically see shallow to medium depth earthquakes occurring along deep rooted faults where crustal compression is taking place. There are several types of earthquake waves. P waves and S waves travel through the Earth's interior and are known as body waves, while R waves and L waves travel just below the Earth's surface and are known as surface waves. P waves, or primary waves, are the waves that travel the fastest and arrive at detectors first. They're compressional waves, so the sense of movement is in a series of expansions and contractions, and they can travel through any kind of material, solid or liquid. S waves, or secondary waves, travel more slowly and arrive after the P waves. They're shear waves, so the sense of movement is from side to side, and unlike P waves, they can't pass through liquids. Surface waves travel more slowly than body waves, but are very destructive. R waves, or Raleigh waves, travel through the surface rocks in a kind of vertical rolling motion, a bit like the waves on the surface of the sea. While L waves, or love waves, cause the surface rocks to move back and forth in a kind of lateral or horizontal motion. Surface waves are the ones that cause the most damage to buildings and other structures, 
Monitoring the passage of earthquake waves has helped scientists to work out the internal structure of the Earth. Detectors up to 103 degrees from an earthquake epicenter register both P and S waves because the Earth's solid mantle is able to transmit both types of waves. But between 103 degrees and 142 degrees from the earthquake epicenter, there's a so-called shadow zone where neither P waves nor S waves are detected. That's because the outer core of the Earth refracts or bends the P waves and absorbs the S waves. However, the P waves are not refracted as much as we'd expect if the whole of the core were liquid, indicating that the inner core is actually solid. Beyond 142 degrees, only P waves are detected because the S waves are unable to pass through the outer liquid part of the core. So in this way, earthquake waves have given us some very important clues about what the interior of the Earth is really like. The first known seismograph, or instrument for detecting and measuring earthquakes, was designed around the year 132 AD by Zhang Heng, who was chief astronomer for the later Han Dynasty in China. His seismometer was a large bronze jar, six feet across, with eight dragon figures spaced around the outside. Below each dragon was a bronze toad, looking up with its mouth wide open. Each dragon had a ball in its mouth, and when an earth tremor occurred, it would trigger a mechanism inside the jar, and the ball would drop with a loud clang into the gaping mouth of the toad below. By recovering the ball, the direction in which the earthquake had occurred could be worked out. Later seismometers comprised two parts. One part attached to a heavy mass that prevented it from vibrating with the earth movements, while the other part was allowed to move freely. The relative motion between the two parts could then be recorded on a seismogram. Modern digital detectors work on similar principles, but are based on the relative motion between a coil of wire and a magnet which induces a current. They can detect movements smaller than one nanometer or one millionth of a meter. As seismographs became more sophisticated, it became possible to develop an objective scale for measuring the energy released by an earthquake. The Richter scale was developed in 1935 by geologist Charles Richter. It measures the magnitude of earthquakes by recording the amplitude of the resulting earthquake waves, with the values converted into a logarithmic scale. Each successive level corresponds to a tenfold increase in wave amplitude, or a 32-fold increase in energy. So a Richter magnitude 6 earthquake is actually more than 1,000 times larger than a magnitude 4 earthquake. In 1979, the Richter scale was replaced by the Moment Magnitude Scale, which is nearly identical to the Richter scale, but provides more reliable estimates of the magnitude of very large earthquakes. However, the media and the public still often refer to these estimates as Richter magnitudes. Another way to estimate the magnitude of an earthquake is based on its physical effects. These effects include such things as movements of the ground surface, both lateral and vertical, structural damage, such as the collapse of walls, bridges and buildings, liquefaction of the ground, resulting from the expulsion of water when loosely packed sediments are shaken, landslips, especially on steep slopes that have been made unstable by rainfall or liquefaction, Tsunamis or water waves generated when an earthquake causes movements on the sea floor. And of course there are often aftershocks in which residual earthquake energy is released minutes, hours or even days after the initial tremor. And all of these physical effects of course add to the human hazards associated with earthquakes. Now we've already mentioned that the Great Chilean Earthquake was the largest earthquake ever recorded. Other very large earthquakes include the Great Alaskan Earthquake of 1964, 
the Sumatran earthquake of 2004, the Japanese earthquake in 2011, and the Kamchatka earthquake of 1952. All of these earthquakes registered magnitude 9 or more on the Richter scale. However, geological evidence indicates that much, much larger earthquakes have taken place in the Earth's past, especially in association with the catastrophic events of Noah's flood. Probably the largest earthquakes ever to occur in the history of the Earth were those associated with the breaking up of the fountains of the Great Deep at the beginning of the flood, recorded in Genesis chapter 7 and verse 11. Kurt Wise and Steve Austin have studied some upper Precambrian sediments called diamictites, which contain gigantic boulders or megaclasts, and which they interpreted as the product of enormous underwater avalanches. These diamictites are worldwide in distribution, and when mapped out, seem to occur around the margins of the pre flood supercontinent. In the flood model, these catastrophic avalanches were triggered by supersized earthquakes associated with the breaking up of the Earth's crust at the very beginning of the flood. Kurt Wise has also been mapping thick seismite layers in the flood deposited rocks of the Upper Cretaceous Lance Formation of Wyoming. These sediment layers have been contorted by liquefaction induced by earthquakes, and they're huge compared to their modern counterparts. Given that modern earthquakes registering over 9 on the magnitude scale generate only a few inches of contorted bedding, what kind of earthquakes must have generated the 5 metre thick seismites evident in the Lance Formation? Moving into post-flood times, Kurt Wise has also pointed to evidence of earthquakes along the San Andreas Fault that were apparently of sufficient magnitude to shear entire mountain ranges off their roots and bounce them across the landscape for tens of miles. One good example being the rootless Kingston Range of the Mojave Desert of Eastern California. But there seems to be a general pattern of declining intensity with respect to earthquakes and many other geological processes towards the present day. In fact, it's sobering to realise that even the most devastating modern earthquakes are only tiny aftershocks of the almost unimaginably catastrophic processes that occurred during the worldwide flood. Moreover, earthquake studies have also provided confirmation of particular events that are recorded in the Bible or by near contemporaries of the biblical writers. For example, Steve Austin has been studying the laminated muds of the Dead Sea in Israel and Jordan, in which he's identified evidence of Uzziah's earthquake of 750 BC, recorded in Amos chapter 1 and verse 1, and Zechariah chapter 14 and verse 5. The 31 BC earthquake, reported by the Jewish historian Josephus in both his Antiquities of the Jews and the Jewish War, as well as the earthquake that took place at the time of the crucifixion of Christ and recorded by the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 27 verses 51 to 54. There's even a thick zone of disturbed sediment within the Dead Sea muds that probably coincides with the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah and the other cities of the plain as described in Genesis chapter 19 verses 24 to 28. Steve Austin's studies, which are still ongoing, provide a fascinating and compelling confirmation of many significant biblical events. As we draw to a conclusion, here are three things to remember as we think about the topic of earthquakes. Firstly, earthquakes are a powerful reminder that there's something wrong with our world. The world, as originally created by God, was very good. Genesis chapter 1, verse 31. There was no agony or bloodshed, nothing to kill or destroy. So-called natural disasters such as famines, floods and earthquakes, even physical death itself, were absent 
These things are consequences of Adam's fall. Reminders, as Paul tells us in Romans chapter 8, verses 18 to 23, that the creation has been subjected to futility and is groaning as with the pains of childbirth as it awaits the liberty that will come when the children of God are revealed. And so when we turn on the news and we hear about yet another terrible disaster, it should make us long even more for the glories of the new redeemed creation to come. Secondly, earthquakes remind us of just how seriously God views sin. In a very real sense, we're still recovering from the greatest catastrophe the world has ever seen, the worldwide flood in the days of Noah. And that judgment was God's response to the wickedness, the violence and the corruption of the world as it then was. Tragically, humans are still sinful, still rebels against God. And it's only of God's grace, mercy and goodness that we're not consumed as Noah's generation was. Today, we live in an era of grace represented by God's rainbow promise, an era in which Christ has come as our Redeemer. And so as we think about earthquakes and what they tell us about God's hatred of sin, may we be drawn towards Christ just as Noah came to the ark as to the only place where salvation can be found. Finally, Earthquakes provide an opportunity for us to make a difference in the lives of those who are less fortunate. How grievous it is to realise that the deadliest earthquakes are not necessarily the largest ones. The earthquake that struck Haiti in 2010 caused more loss of life than some larger earthquakes. Why? Because it occurred in a region of extreme poverty. Many more people died than was necessary because the buildings were poorly constructed and the infrastructure was inadequate to cope with those who were injured. So how can we play our part in relieving the suffering of others and in making sure that the poorest people in the world aren't disproportionately affected by natural disasters such as earthquakes? Or in other words, How can we, as Christians, show the same grace, compassion and love to others that Christ has already shown to us?